We want to try to, to remember those who need prayers. And uh, maybe you have someone. I know, Rick, you got your, Richard, you got your stitches out, right? So, and I wasn't able to be there Thursday. I had to go to a funeral. Um, second, my second cousin, our second cousin, our second cousin, 38 years old. Uh, he had already had a motorcycle accident several years ago and been paralyzed. And uh, then he had an operation where they had to leave the stomach open. They, it was going to have to heal from the inside out. And it kept getting infected and kept having problems. And I, they believe that's what really ended up in his death is got so infected and everything that it, that it killed him. Um, but so I know you don't know them. Pam has come here. Pam Kirk has come here some. So she's you may know Pam Kirk, but it, that's his mother that that came here. So uh, can remember that family in prayer because because of their. I mean their. I could tell they were just so. In, they were just so in shock, I guess, that, that nothing seemed real to them that day. And then I guess that's easy to understand when you lose a child like that, that it's, yeah, you know. Not, so I can't really say I know how you feel on that because I haven't lost a child yet. So I wouldn't, you know, you can... You can sympathize and know that inside of them, you got to know they're having a lot of pain. But as far as experiencing what that pain is like, and even if I did had lost one, it's so different with each and every person anyway. So how they handle things. <coughs> yeah, now they got to raise his kids, and with because you know because of this. So. I want to continue to remember them in your prayers if you don't, if you can. And it's uh, it's our second cousin, Phyllis and I's second cousin. It's Pam Kirk. She's been here a few times, uh, and uh, Pam, it's her son that uh, that passed away. He had he had a motorcycle accident. And he was paralyzed, and. Uh, uh, and his name was Jonathan, and you may have seen him advertised on TV on one. I think it's Morrison King or something, or Morrison somebody. That, that very hurts. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that is Barry's son, Barry and Pam. So, like I said, you know, remember them. Continue to remember uh, Richard and, and Rick. Is he doing any better? With his. Yeah, he he's been having vertigo, too, and so he's he's kind of had some issues. And he was getting so much better, and you think, oh, you know, he's well on his way, and everything's looking good, and taste is coming back a little bit, and here and there, so. You think, man, everything's going good, and then he had vertigo, and I'm, I'm telling you, I had, I, when I have vertigo, I crawl. There ain't no getting up. It, it, uh, everything starts spinning. Of course, I get sick. Then I can't get up because I'm, everything's spinning. So I have to crawl. It, it's awful for when I have it. Uh, thank goodness I hadn't had that in a little while. Uh, see. Still want to remember Cheryl and, and Amy and Chris and that family. It sounds like when you name Richard's family, it's like a, the prayer list, it's like a family reunion, nearly. Um, Gwen and um, Philip, I want to continue to remember Gwen and Philip. Uh, we've had some deaths in the family here lately. In our and relative to our church family, we want to remember those who's lost loved ones. Um, 
my memory. Yeah, Carolyn Williams. I want to continue to remember Carolyn. And who? Yeah, well, Beverly, I, I, I guess because she's my wife, I have a hard time sometimes announcing that, but uh, she went to see her family doctor the other day. She can't get an MRI until August the 6th. She's hoping her family doctor can help her to get an MRI in Birmingham or Nashville so that we can get this quicker so that they can solve this problem her neck and back. It, it, it's really painful. Uh, anything else? Anybody else? Has the bell rung yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got Scott to lead our minds in prayer, Scott. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and all the many blessings you've given us. Lord, we ask that you be with everyone and their prayer requests at this time. Be with the Kirk family and all those mentioned here recently. Lord, we ask that you take this lesson that we're about to have and take it to the best of our ability and use it to the best of our ability and take it throughout the day as we go out through our day, throughout this week, and use it. Lord, we ask that you forgive our sins, and ultimately, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross to forgive us for our sins. Thank you for this day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Okay, I'll... I'll just a real brief reminder. We don't. We're not going to spend much time on this at all. We talked about the rich man and the poor man, and that the rich, the, the poor man was to be. He was humble. He was disguised, distinguished, or not distinguished. He was a subservient. He was all these things, and yet he was to be. He was to glorify because of his high. Uh, position he, he was to be exalted so even sometimes when we no matter what our social standing is no matter what our financial standing is that there's a place where we can glorify God and then we talked about that rich person maybe the word the Greek word there that tapanos was that they had a reversal of fortunes so maybe when he left Jerusalem, we're, what you know, we're addressing people who has been scattered. We're addressing people that is of the diaspora, and so maybe when he they left Jerusalem uh, to go into this other land, maybe they were poor, and we don't know that. But that's the Greek word is kind of gives that idea there to it. So he he's going from a, maybe from a poor person to a rich person. And, uh, and maybe the, the poor person went from a rich person to a poor person because that same Greek word is used in both cases. But the point is, no matter where we're at in the status, I don't care if you're rich or poor, I don't care if you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you're going to go through trials. You're going to go through tribulations and hardships and everything. The difference is, is how do we handle them. And here, you... We, you, don't, you don't have, we talked about how the love of the money was, was uh, a root of all evil. It wasn't money. It was the root of money. That's the, that's the problem. If that's your focus, if that's where you're uh, concentrating on, then that's all kinds of evil. But if you can imagine, if I went from a very poor person to a rich person, and I did that kind of fairly quickly, there's a lot of trials with that. And we always think about loving the, mo uh, the love of money kind of related to a rich person. But it's also true with a poor person because a poor person, what do they sometimes do but they don't have nothing? What do they have a tendency to do? Steal. Is that the love of money? That's the love of money, things, you know, that, that kind of thing. Because if you wouldn't, why would you go steal if you were content with where you're at? If, if you're exalted yourself and you know that God has exalted you, 
and uh, praised you and gave you what he felt like you could handle. And a lot of times, maybe we could, what if we were rich and we decided, oh, I'd love to be rich. We may love to be rich, but how do you know how you would handle that? And would you remain a child of God if you were rich? And these things we think we would, and we hope we would, but would we? And that's the question. So, so a lot of times, maybe God puts us where we're at because that's where we need to be as far as those kind of status goes, whether we're rich or poor and things. And so we talked about uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 18. And basically, that's what that's talking about is there's the things you see, they're temporary. But the things you don't see, now those are things that's eternal. And that's where we need to have our focus on things where we don't, things that we don't see. You can't, you can see God in his works, but you can't physically see God. But where do you want to have your concentration on? And you can't see heaven, but you, you know there's a heaven because one, he said there was, and I believe him. So because of that, where's our focus? And where's, where's our concentration? And Paul says, and, and no matter what state I'm in, I'm content. I've not, he says, I know how to be been hungry. I've been poor. I've been homeless. I've been everything you can imagine. He says, I don't care what I went through. I'm, I'm content with what God's given me. So that was kind of the idea. I don't, didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. Uh, verse 12 is where we're at now. James chapter 1, verse 12. We are moving at Lightning pace now. <laughs> and boy, this right here, if you if you were reading this in the Greek, everything that we've seen so far in as far as the temptation part, the endurance part, every one of these words is already being used. It says blessed, and what does that mean? Happy. Happy is the man. And that man there is man, woman. That's not just man. That's whether you're a man or you're a woman. Happy is the man who endures. And there's our, there's one of our words that hupomene, you know, that's the word we've been using throughout all 11 verses narrowly. That's endurance. That's the endurance steadfast. It blesses the person who endures temptation. There's that Rea Moss. That's verse 2 for trials. And so again, he's just using the same old Greek words over and over here. He says, for one, blessed is the happy is that man who endures these trials and these troubles and stuff. For when he has been approved, that's the other uh, Greek word that was back in verse 3 that has was the word for testing. He says, Blessed are the man who has been approved, and he will receive the Stephanos, the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So here's our ultimate goal. All through this time we've seen, if we're here and God wants us here, we, he needs a trial. We need a trial for, to get us from one place to the next. We, I know we've said that over and over and over again. But what he wants us to do ultimately is he wants us to spend eternity in heaven with him. That's what he wants ultimately. He wants us to be Christ-like while we're here on the face of this earth. And, and so he says, now you've won this. You've become victorious. I know he's become victorious because I'm giving you a crown. Or basically this was a wreath. Uh, and what they would give it to like if you were in the Olympics, in the Greek Olympics back then, they would give you a wreath when you won. You're getting a wreath. You've gone through these trials. You've gone through these temptations. You've let God have his work. You've let God do his, what he's planning on doing, what he's trying to do with it. 
And guess what? You won. You're victorious. And ultimately, these victorious victories that we have here on the earth while we're getting our way up to heaven will help build our faith. And James wants our faith built so we can be mature, so we can have uh, exactly what this is here. We can be blessed and we can win a crown of our life when this life is over as well as win a, a crown through each victory that we have when we go through these trials and tribulations. And so, uh, again, all these words are, has been words that we have seen. Now, who, who does this victory go to according to verse 12? Who? And which the Lord has promised to those who Faithful and that love him, and how do we, how do we know we love him? And keep him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments on this. So God has said there there's a there's an end to this. There's a promise in this, and that is that you can be victorious. And once you're victorious on these little trials that you go through, in the end your home your home is in heaven. And he's, that's a promise. He said that, that's something that you can take to the bank. And it's hard to sometimes realize when we're going through these trials and when we're going through these tribulations and these hardships that what God is trying to do in our life. And, uh, but when you see this part here, when you see, you, can you just imagine, I'm an I'm a Alabama fan, most everybody knows that. But, but I, I really loved a, a Auburn coach one time because he pinned my medal around my neck. Shook Jordan <laughs> pinned my medal. And I, I was glad. I didn't care who did it. I was just glad he did it. And so I had a love for Shook Jordan <laughs> for a while because he put that medal around my neck and, uh, and track. And uh, so... But that, that's a great feeling to win like that. That's a great feeling to go through these uh, trials and come out victorious. And that's what God is trying to get us to do. And it's a promise. So remember now, these are something that's promised to you that you, if you can endure these things. Is it real or is it memory? How to handle temptations. This is going to be, this time we're going to deal with different types of temptations than what we have been doing. This is James 1 verses 13 through 18. How do we handle these temptations? Is our faith real? Is our faith genuine? Or are we playing? <laughs> and that's kind of the idea that James has here. Uh, James 1, 13 through 18. Who wants to read that? And then we'll talk about it. All right. Go ahead, Scott. Scott, wait on Scott. <laughs> when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged, by, dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. When then after desire has conce conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly light. Who does not change like the sh shifting shadows? He chose to give us birth through the word and tr of truth, and we might be kind of first fruits of all he created. What's, what's your translation? I like it. The NIV. NIV. Well, I just, a lot of that is so, it's descriptive of what's going on in here that you can't always see from uh, the New King James and first version and stuff that I use. 
All right, let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and, and does, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Uh, keep in mind again, and I've said this over and over, God wants us to be in a mature relationship with him and, and so to do that we've had to go through these trials these trials in the first 12 verses is different from what this trial is or temptation or trial these first 12 verses trials was it could be sickness it could be you lost your job it could be marital problems it could be anything kind of on an outside basis that's the first 12 verses that you're going through. This temptation is different. And so you, you want to try to picture what's going on because this, this temptation, this trial is happening in here and inside of us. And it's that battle between that our outward man and that old sinful nature man and the resurrected man, this new nature man. That's, yes, flesh and spirit. That's, that's the battle that's going on here uh, in this part. And so you might ask, well, why is James now mixing these two together? Why is he putting them together here? Well, the, the issue is in these first 12 verses, and the trials and tribulations that you were going through, a lot of time what Satan will do while you're going through this trials that's outward, he comes inside and he's, he's trying to make you think that God don't love you. He don't care nothing about you. If he was, why are you going through this? Why, why, why is there death in the family? Why, why do you lose a son? I mean, these things then, what Satan's going to come in and do. See, everybody's experiences that. That's not a Christian or a non-Christian thing. That's, a, that's a, just a life thing. That people die and people lose things. It's not a Christian or a non-Christian thing that people go through health problems and health issues. Every, everybody goes through them nearly. The deal part is, is what, what are you going to, what do you as a Christian, what are you battling in here? And Satan don't want you to win. God wants you to gain maturity. God wants you to be, take a step from here to here. Satan wants you to lose. He want, he's out to devour you. He's, like, he's walking around like a roaring lion trying to seek whom he can devour. He wants you to lose. And so it's so important that when we're going through these things and you find something that's tugging at you inside and kind of pushing you sort of a little bit away, you need, we need to understand that that's not God. And these temptations that happen inside, that's the flesh of man battling. That's Satan. What did he do when he was uh, when Eve was in the garden? I mean, he, God said, "The day you eat of this, you're going to die." But here's Eve looking up here at this fruit, whatever this fruit was, and it looked really good. That was some awesome looking fruit. So what did Satan do? He said, "Did you, did God say you're going to? Die? That's not going to happen." You're not really going to die. And it looked like he was telling the truth, doesn't it? Because Adam lived to be what? 930 years old. So when he said you're not going to die today, and Adam went on to live to 930 years old, it looks like he's telling the truth. But he wasn't. They died that day. They died spiritually that day also brought about physical death. But Satan wanted to paint a picture here. Uh, uh, here's, here, look at that fruit. And God, I know he said it, you were going to die. You're not. 
And I know there's another thing he had not told you is if you take this fruit, that you're going to be as wise as God. Your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be as wise as God. Man, who wouldn't want that? Or at least you'd think you want that anyway <laughs> from that standpoint. Here's what he don't do. Satan never tells you the cost and the price behind it. All these things. I brought a little something. Well, let me let me just do this another way. I'll wait till I get there. Um, like I said, he's taking, he's connecting these two temptation trials, an outward trial and the inward trial, and he's we're going through things on the outside, and Satan is coming on the inside. To, to put questions us if God loves us, does he care about us? We need to understand what Satan is trying to do. He's running around like a roaring lion. He's trying to devour you. He wants you to fail. And he wants to offer you an opportunity to get through these difficult, he wants to kind of, you know in Matthew chapter four when Jesus is going in the temptation there and he's going through his temptation, Satan uses scripture and then Jesus uses another scripture. And what they're doing, so Satan says, this is all right. Look, here's, the Bible says it's okay. And you can do this. But then Jesus picked a better scripture and says, yeah, but he says, don't tempt me. You shall not tempt the Lord our God. So Satan, also, sometimes he uses scripture and he, makes, he paints this picture and everything of how everything is so wonderful. And, but again, he doesn't show you the whole picture. He doesn't give you, what, what is it going to cost me at the end of this? And, yeah. Of God, for God cannot be tempted. You know, he's dealing with an age-old problem, too, for back from the Garden of Eden that you mentioned a few minutes ago. Adam, uh, well, uh, Eve even tried. She said, the, the devil tempted me. And, I, and then Adam, when he got to Adam, said, that woman you gave me mm -hmm. tempted me. So both of them are blaming, blaming God, in essence, for, for the problem. And, and we still have a tendency sometimes today to do that, or human, humanity does. Yes, to, we are, to we're always God blaming somebody problem. else. And he's telling them, telling them right here, don't you do that. that that's exactly right. He, um, what Satan is going to try to do, Scott. I was going to say, you know, God cannot be tempted by sin. Right. And God will not tempt us to sin. If we, if we sin, it comes from within us. Yeah. You know, if we have a personal sin, that comes from within our heart, within our lust. Is where that comes. It doesn't come from God. God, and, and we'll kind of see this evidence of this in, as we kind of go here for just a second. But he, here God, God is trying to make us better. God doesn't do anything to harm us and to hurt us. Satan, on the other hand, is, is trying to get you to give in to this temptation. And he does that by coming to the, to the fleshly man, letting the fleshly man take over uh, from the spiritual man. Um, here, they, these people are, they may be scattered. They may be scattered abroad and stuff, but they're not sheltered. God can't, God's not going to keep you from the temptation. He's not going to give you that. Now, he'll give you trials and stuff to, to try to build you up. But he is not going, he can't keep you from, when you're tempted by Satan, he can't keep you from going through that trial and temptation. He's going to let you go through it and let you have your choice not to obey that, not to listen to what God's... Uh, what Satan is trying to tell you uh, and trying to do for, to you. Uh, there, are, there are kind of three different facts that we can consider on how we can overcome this temptation. And we, we looked at some things, how we overcome these trials. 
Now one of the things we can do is look and see how can we overcome this, these temptations that Satan's putting us through. And the one is found in verses 13 through 16, and it's considered God's judgment. And so if, when you look at that, what, what is God's, when we, we're kind of looking at I know this is kind of a negative approach to it, and uh, sometimes we don't like a negative approach, but it's an important one. Because what's going to be the end of this, when sin has its complete job, what's going to be the end of it? Death. You got, that's going to be eternal separation from God. You need to understand what, God, what Satan is offering you is eternal separation from God. That's, his, that's his, what he's offering you. He's going to paint it. He's going to make it look good. He's going to make it sound good. But ultimately what he is offering you is death. And so we don't want to do that. And you, want to, you don't want to blame God for these temptations because God is holy. God is righteous. God can't be tempted to sin. He loves us too much to, make, to allow us to sin. And, and to, or at least to put sin out there in front of us to tempt us with it. And so God doesn't do that. Just, just his nature, who he is, what he is, won't allow him to tempt you uh, like that because he can't be tempted like that. And so many times, this is kind of Mark's last lesson. We kind of got into this part of, of things when... Uh, God, what Satan wants to do sometimes, we, we got these desires that's built inside of us, right? I mean, we got hung, when you get hungry and you get thirsty, you go, you go eat and get thirsty. And we agreed that we won't talk about glutton. We've had an agreement on that already, that we won't speak on glutton. But that's, a, that's an issue when God gives us a desire to be hungry, and yet, when we take that desire to be hungry and we overdo it or we step outside of God's boundaries, that's not God. That's us making a decision on doing that. If we get thirsty and we drink things that we maybe shouldn't drink or do things we shouldn't do as far as that goes, we're getting outside of the will of God. God gave us desire for our, the sexual desire. That's meant to be inside of God's perimeters. You go outside of God's perimeters, then, you know, then that's where, that's, that's a temptation that didn't come from God. And, uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what happened there and what happens today when, like, well, what happened with King David? <coughs> Yes. Anytime we step out to do something like that, then that child that was born was, was death, died, mm -hmm. brought forth death, sin that Adam and, I mean, that uh, David and Bathsheba committed. So. I mean, there's so many ways that Satan comes to you to try to destroy you and try to make us, this look good. And the first, there's stages of sin that's mentioned here. And the first stage of sin that we found that's found is in verse 14 is desire, our, our lust, echo, echo, and when Scott read that a while ago, what the idea behind that was that you got a desire here, but at first you're trying to resist it. So he's Satan is kind of dragging you. Uh, he's he's got to drag you along here at first. And that's, that's, he's drawing you away. This desire, this Greek word here, has something to do with like, who, who we got in here that's hunters that maybe has trapped or trapped animals before? That's this word. This word has to do with hunters trapping an animal. Now, I've seen animals trapped and stuff. They just don't go to the trap just automatically. You need to put something in there. And if you don't put something in there to lure them 
to that trap, they don't, they don't go in there. They're not just going to volunteer to say, oh, you know what, I think I'll go in that trap. They have something has to be put in there, some kind of bait to lure them and to trick them to go in into that. They just don't walk into it. That's the first part. The first part is this desire. And Satan, like in the Garden of Eden, puts something up there that dangles it in front of you to make you do this, to make you want to do this. You've already got the desire. The, the desire is there. She had a desire when she saw that fruit and it looked so good. She had a desire to do it. And then, then comes the next part. He's, he's, she's probably doubting. She's you know, not wanting to. There's that part of where he's trying to drag her along and using bait to do it. The second part that, that he goes through, the first one is desire. The next thing he goes through, and we have all kinds of desires that God's put into us, and we've talked about that, and that he uses, you know, that's good. And it's when we get outside these parameters, and that's what Satan is trying to do. The second one that you see there is deception. That's in verse 14. And that is della adzo. And that means to entrap, lure, and entice. This is a fishing term. Know a little bit about fishing. I, how many of you would probably, this little thing right here, does that really look like a worm to you? See, that don't really look like a, like a worm to me, totally. Fake as it can be. There, there you go. Because this is, this is what Satan's doing to you. I don't know how many I've got. But I, got I got a few. Because this is what God's trying to do to us. I mean, not God. But this is what Satan's trying to do to us. See, I'm going to tell you about this little animal right here. This little dude right here. It, he, this is bad to the bone. You take this and, and you bring it along the grass. And there's a grass pocket there and it's got a little opening in it. You drop this little thing down in there and that thing starts doing this little number going down and swimming in there. That bass cannot resist it. Can't do it. He's going to hit it every single time. If you throw, if you throw a, if you throw that, when you throw this thing down in here, he gets it. If you throw a, a, just a hook in there that's not baited and don't have nothing in it, you're not going to hit him. You, you're, just, you're not going to get it. But if you put this on there, even though it looks it's fake, don't even look real, you put this on there, it drives him nuts. It drives him crazy. And so here's the whole idea behind this is he needs to you need something on the hook in order when this goes down, swims down, it looks real, and that Satan, this is what Satan uses. Somewhere in that Along with this temptation, he uses a, a bait like this. But if he didn't have it, you're not going to catch that fish. He's not going to catch you. He needs, to, he needs to give you something and put something in you that is um, that will entice you, that will bring you to him. I can't tell you how many fish I caught. I can tell you how many I caught with a with a naked boat hook, none. But I can't tell you how many of those I've caught using that, dropping it in these pockets of grass and stuff because the fish, they know it's not real. It ain't real, it don't look real. But they can't help it. It just entices them. And that's what Satan does in our lives when we're going through these trials and tribulations and stuff from an import part. The reason why we fail is because he puts a bait out there that we can't resist or that we don't resist. 
I thought I might get a little faster, but I didn't that much. But I'm going to. I'm going to get faster. <laughs> if somebody wants some of these, just let me know.